Welcome back to another Terranscapes video. Uh, today I'm going to revisit the castle project. Uh, I have been doing quite a bit of work and quite a bit of experimentation and I wanted to show you some of the progress that's been done, do a check-in with the customer and uh, talk about where I'm going to go from here. Uh, first, before I begin though, uh, you may notice that these walls are curved, and if you've been following the videos, you saw that uh, my last video I said I was abandoning a curve because, you know, I couldn't get the wall to bend, whatever. I want to say that I got so many really helpful comments and tips from people uh, that have totally revamped the way I'm moving forward with this project, and I didn't expect to get that many, you know, really important suggestions and tips from the community, the community, even though I, I've been noticing that that word is perhaps being bandied about uh, as to what it means. But in any case, my viewers, you, you know, the, the, the viewers of terrain videos and, and whatnot. Uh, so I wanted to put a few thank yous out uh, to the people, and of course I'm not really good at recording and I didn't think about it as the suggestions were coming in, but I realized later on I, I just wanted to thank you know the person who suggested I go to Lowe's instead of Home Depot to look for foam as they have different thicknesses and, and widths of foam. That was an important discovery. Um, the person who said don't give up on circular, he thought circular was going to look a lot better. Um, I tend to think that might be true, and so I wanted to thank, thank him or her, I can't remember. Uh, and um, you, know, you know who you are. And the um, Hotwire Foam Factory, they saw the video, and they actually connected me with somebody who had done one of the projects on their website and said, hey, this guy did round walls like these, and he apparently uh, sent them you know, a page of text that they forwarded to me on some of the tips that he had used, and then um, also uh, I contacted him directly, and he was super helpful, and this was um, Tom Young, who had done the Minas, one of the Minas Tirith uh, castles on the site, the one with the large uh, uh, foam circular structures. So, um, and, then, and then I shouldn't forget, and then somebody made the suggestion of how to groove the back of the board properly so that you could bend it more easily. Um, that was successful and helpful, so uh, I can't, you know, anyway, it was surprising to me and it made me realize that um, I shouldn't be afraid to, when I get stuck, rather than think, I'll fix it on my own and then tell you about how I'm going to fix it, maybe I should go forward and say, hey, do any of you have suggestions? Because, uh, you know, with all of our brains coming together and being willing to share, you know, a lot of improvements can be made for everybody. So uh, I just wanted to put that thank you out to all those people and say that it meant a lot to me and it's really kind of reinvigorated me to, to get back into this project. So um, let me start, I guess, with the way I progressed through up to this point. So this is going to be a, a quite a bit longer video as there's several things that have happened since um, we, last, we last chatted. Uh, so first, um, let's talk about the grooving. As you recall, um, I had um, grooved the back of a board, and what I had done actually is I had cut V's into the board with a uh, utility blade and to try to remove material to allow it to curve more. Now that was in three quarter inch foam. I didn't have any half inch foam. Got the half inch foam from Lowe's. Um, they have it in four by eight sheets, and so I had to actually cut it down to get it home in the uh, on the top of my. Toyota Echo, if you can believe it, that's my major transportation for all my uh, foam. Uh, but in any case, um, so I got the half inch foam and I tried the groove that was suggested, which is in uh, woodworking, uh, what they do is they cut a straight sided U shaped groove, all right, which obviously planes, you know, the center of the groove to a much thinner thickness. Um, so you have these thin spots all across the, you know, the length of the board. So what I did for this instance is I actually used, I used my tippy cutter. It's, a, it's another hot wire tool and it was only because it was just a little bit quicker for me to set it up and use it. Although I did use the hot wires foam factory sled, which the tippy tool actually fit into, um, to carve these grooves. But you could easily do this with the Hot Wire Foam Factory's freehand router um, if you have that, which is nice because it's all in one. I just happen to have a tippy tool from years back, and if you don't know what a tippy tool is, it's T-I-P-P-I. -P -P -I. You can look it up on your own. But um, what I did then is I grooved the back of this much deeper, my half-inch foam, with a much wider. Now, these are not actually square cuts. Uh, it's a slightly rounded uh, bottom, but I figured it'd be good enough for the experiment. This is an experimental board just to see if I could do this before I, I moved on. 
Then, my other thought, which I then confirmed with um, Tom Young on uh, the Ministerith project, was that um, actually carving in the brickwork, which I hadn't done in my first experiment, might also allow it to flex some more, since you're removing you know, some material from the front, which can allow that to expand a little bit, even though it's staggered. So I decided to quickly go through, and with the uh, Hot Wire Foam Factory's engraving tool, I sound like I'm doing an ad for them, but you know their tools are really helpful here. Um, I basically, quickly, using a straight edge and the sled, I ran the sled down, um, and when I do the final piece, I'll show you a video of how that works, all right? Uh, but I ran the sled down this uh, to make the straight lines for the bricks, because this would be faced like this, but my lights are in the way, so I'm not holding it like that, all right? And then, um, using a just a hand ruler I, and the free, you know, free hand holding the engraver, I just struck all the cross marks and did a wide section of that. And then I took the original curved piece that I had done as my test for the original setup, and I just wanted to see if it would bend around it. And sure enough, um, I don't know if we'll be able to see that, um, but this bends quite a bit, and it's a lot less to bend it than it was before. Uh, when I was trying this before. I think I can improve on this um, with a slightly deeper cut square on that shape and I think I'm going to get pretty good flex. I actually was trying to flex it beyond the radius, uh, the, I should say the uh, circumference of my circle. I wanted a tighter circle just to see if I could and I over flexed it a little bit and I broke it just a little but it still is holding together and um, Tom had mentioned on his uh, help with me that he had even had a couple bricks pop out when he was flexing it on some of the smaller surfaces so that kind of gives me the impression that I need to go a little thinner here and then when I'm engraving I'm going to be almost meeting that cut uh, you know in thickness so it's going to be very very thin walled on the outside and uh, that should be able to bend around it so with that experiment out of the way I decided what the hell let's go back to circular so then what I did is um, using uh, Tom's tip and I'm going to insert a video here right now show you um, I used a, a, a meter stick as a protractor and I'm going to explain that process in the uh, video clip coming up. So in this clip you can see, um, and I've sped it up quite a bit, but you should be able to get a good idea, that what I've done <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, drill a hole in the yardstick and insert the Hot Wires uh, Foam Factories. Uh, this is the um, six inch hot knife, I believe. Uh, and the hot knife uh, then when mounted to the sled and I've used a little tape and a, a couple nails to hold it in place uh, then once it's mounted into the sled and you adjust it for vertical you can uh, use the uh, meter stick as a basically as a, as a fulcrum as a, as a protractor and what I've done then is I've measured the distance from where the hot wire uh, knife is to the end of the meter stick drilled another hole there and then used a large nail to impale the foam then I can use the meter stick to guide a perfect circle around it. And this is again thanks to Tom Young uh, as he gave me this idea and really worked out very well for drawing up a perfect circle uh, in the foam. In this second clip, what I've done, uh, and I'll slow it down a little bit here more so we can talk about it a little more, is that I've measured in three inches from my initial point, drilled a new hole, and then, actually, uh, in this case, I did do a three-inch cut, and I later had to go back and redo this cut for the four and a quarter inches that's required for the project. But in any case, it was a nice practice, uh, and I might use these pieces for something else. But moving on to what, what's going on here. So then by drilling the new hole and then in reinserting the nail into the original place in the foam, I can get a perfect cut for the second cut to then have you know parallel lines for the outer wall circle. Uh, and this is the kind of process you just repeat for subsequent cuts inside as you go deeper and deeper to cut your in, you know, interior slices to create all the circles for all the different uh, walls, floor sections, etc. for the entire structure. Now here, because I want to take into account the thickness of the walls, uh, which I'm going to explain again when I talk about the project away from these uh, cuts. I want to accommodate the thickness of the wall that's going to go around the inside of the, uh, the, the outer wall structure, right? So I'm going to foam up against it. So I wanted to trim a half an inch of foam 
uh, away from that so that because uh, I need that space to insert the wall later on. Again, on that you'll see this probably make more sense later. But notice, um, even with these kinds of thin cuts, you can get really nice parallel cuts by using this process. Uh, this process really worked out very well. Now, I should mention during this segment um, that I am actually cutting through two layers of foam at a time. And then I have a third layer underneath that to give some room for the blade. So this way I can cut two sections at a time. Uh, and you know, you're limited really only by the thickness of the blade here. And with a little layer of foam underneath all of these pieces, I won't be getting the table underneath. And here quickly you can see me removing the sections that I've cut. These are uh, four inches or two layers deep. And you can see the foam layer underneath that gives me the, the buffer from the table. So, seeing how I could cut those circles uniformly, then I went through <clears throat> and cut all the foam that I needed using, again, the thank you for the Lowe's tip, um, two inch expanded polystyrene. Uh, these is, this is the white bead styrofoam uh, that I picked up at Lowe's. Again, another um, four by eight sheet, so I could cut that down in half, get that on top of the car, bring it home. And what I did is at the same time, I cut the upper deck for each of these. That way, I knew the upper deck is a perfect fit for the, the wall, and I'll have the outside wall come up above it um, with whatever battlements or whatever, and I've got some thoughts on that. And then um, I can have the inner wall come up to meet it as well. So let's take a closer look on the inside of this, and I can explain some of the uh, potential assembly and some plans for that. Because of the size of this and its overall height on the workbench, I'm going to go freehand on this. So, you know, take your Dramamine and put on your seatbelts because we're going to go flying cam on here. Uh, now, the customer, um, originally I had planned to go 10 inches high. Customer asked if I would go 12. So these are 2 inch sections, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, plus an extra um, 3 quarter of an inch for the upper deck. Uh, this is actually, it does need to be 12 because he'd like an entrance that's going to be nine and a half inches high, which can, uh, in theory, accommodate a Mumakel, although I question that because of um, some of the spires that come off it, but it depends on how he's modeled it, and that was his request. So obviously we're going to need quite a large wall to be able to fit in such a large entrance. Then what I did, I'll come inside here, is at the same time, okay, if, in between, as, as you probably saw in the video, um, I cut each of these rings at the same time, but what I did is I left a half inch gap in between each layer so that this could accommodate the thickness of the half inch wall that would be the external you know, plate for this section. Now remember, this whole project is gonna have to be modular for shipping. This is gonna have to be subdivided, magnetized so they can all go together. Um, so I'm planning on walling, like say this inner s section here and then this will be free form, freestanding. I think I can box this up by itself. And then this piece will merely butt up against that wall. So I can drop that wall down all the way to the ground, um, which will, you know, be a nice even union all the way around. Again, when I cut these inner circles, I cut the deck for that as well. So this will be the inner floor, although this might have to be modified because the plan is to have it slope up to some degree on this side and then enter into a section in the wall here. This would be the inner wall. Whoop, I pan, keep it in frame. There we go. Look at that. All right. <laughs> Apologize. Uh, so this would be the inner wall here. Now this has to be a little bit higher than the outer wall. And so what I've done is I've gone an extra um, four inches in height on that. Uh, and I may drop that down one as I think this is quite a big transition to get up here. But I figured let's just cut it while I had it all set up and I could decide on that later. And then the upper deck for this, again, this will have a wall that'll come up. And I think some, some hanging buttresses coming off of this, not buttresses, but towers, you know, that hang off and then come down to meet. I'll have to think about that carefully because, again, I don't want to interfere with the inner workings of this, assuming a Mumikil can fit in here. And I'm going to talk more about that in a second. Then uh, in the inside here would be the, the inner, you know, sort of sanctum, you know, the inner part of innermost section of the castle. Again, this is a little bit deeper um, than I originally planned because I raised this up a little bit. So, but I think if I take this off, this will look a little bit more in proportion to this, um, probably with its own stairway accessing, actually no stairway. Why? Because in this corner, let's, let's pan back a little bit. I don't, I don't like doing it this way. I hope you guys are okay with this. 
and gals, um, there will be a large tower that will meet that corner section. So I'll actually carve out a round section there to receive the large tower that will come up and then will you know rise up above the entire structure. Um, I'm not worried about that. I'll be able to carve that out of each of these layers in the future, uh, but I figured I'd just go for the half circle as it is. So what have I changed from my original plans? Well, one, originally the plan I thought would be four inches for the width here. Customer mentioned the Muma Kill. I said six. Then when I cut it, I said six and a half. So I actually have expanded this to six and a half. This wall was planned to be two, and I thought two looked a little thin. So I ended up going three on this. Why did I go three here? Well, because originally this was supposed to be three, but then the customer requested it be, um, I think it's four and a quarter. I'd have to get my ruler out. So I had to expand this. So keeping this outside radius, what's happened is this wall got thicker, this section got deeper, this wall got thicker, so this inner area in here took the brunt of that and shrunk up considerably, lost probably uh, two inches in diameter, uh, maybe a little more than that for the whole process. Uh, but it's a, it's a compromise to keep the overall diameter of the, the outer wall at a reasonable proportion because if I, if I expanded out this way, I could gain quite a bit um, on these uh, ends out here. So that was the thought. And that was the, the changes that I made. Plus, I had to account for the thickness of the walls, which my original drawing did not take into account. Um, I really didn't think about how that would bulk it out. So it's changed quite a bit, um, but nevertheless is um, you know still, I think, um, going to be pretty functional and very playable. Certainly, um, the extra space for the 6.5 in here is going to make it much easier to reach into this deeper interior to move miniatures and to do that. Uh, over here will be the stairs that will come up along the side of the wall. And then um, over here somewhere will be the walkway that will go out to the flying uh, tower that's going to be set off to the side with the raised walkway connecting to the wall. So, with this work out of the way, I wanted to pause for a second and think about how the towers that are going to go on the outside of the wall are going to look and um, how I'm going to go about carving that and building them. Originally my plan, um, and it's still the plan, to do the external towers is to build the cylinders using the um, Hotwire uh, Foam Factory's um, 3D scroll table because I can cut cylinders shown in a previous video. I will revisit that when I do that work. Um, but to cut those cylinders, assemble them, and then cut them in half, and then use each half against this so that they'll come up. Now that'll need just a little shaping on the inside to fit up snug against the walls, but that's the plan to have that come up, and I'll, I'll deal with the uh, top union to the wall when I get to that point. Uh, but I was thinking about how to go about carving those, what foam to use. The thing is, is that I wanted to maybe use up some of the polystyrene that I have from this. As you can imagine, there was quite a bit of foam left over from this project. I didn't want to see that go to waste necessarily. And then I thought perhaps, um, you know, this foam might present some advantages that the uh, regular extruded foam, which is, you know, like this pink stuff up here, this is extruded, this is expanded. Um, that this extruded foam maybe wouldn't offer. One of the things I noticed when I carved this is that the surface texture, because of all those beads being cut and melted, um, it's got a little bit of a rough surface to it. So I thought perhaps I'm halfway on my way to a stone look by maintaining that, plus I'd be able to use that extra um, foam for uh, building the, the, you know, the buttresses and the, the uh, you know, towers and whatnot. So what I did is I took a um, piece of scrap foam and I used the engraver mounted to the table to see if I could carve perfectly straight lines by rotating the cylinder on the table. That worked out very well actually. Um, so using the hand engraver mounted to the sled, clipped to the table, um, I think I have a video of that and I'll insert that here so you can see it. And I'll revisit that when I go do the final project. I plan on trying to video several sections of work uh, as I move through this. 
Um, that allowed me to draw on the circle nice straight lines that were parallel all the way across it. That's a concern of mine as I don't really want to freehand those and putting a ruler up against a surface, you know, and trying to keep that straight seemed like it might be a challenge. So that was one way. Then I just went in real quickly and I just freehand dropped in the in between lines on the blocks to see how it felt, see what it did. But of course this foam, I told you this is a longer video. <laughs> This foam is um, quite a bit softer than the ex extruded polystyrene. This is why most people use pink foam, besides the fact that the beads are a mess. Um, this is quite a bit, has a higher density and it's a lot stronger. But of course, the foam factory makes um, foam coatings. And so what I decided to do is to put over this uh, a thin coat of the foam coat, which is their gypsum cement uh, foam coating material with a little boost added so it'd get a nice bond. The, and if you haven't seen my video on foam coat, you should go back into the repository and take a look at that because um, I'm going to try not to cover too much material twice here. I put a very thin coat on, however, as I was afraid it would fill in, and I'll give you a closer up of this in a second, I was afraid it would fill in these gaps, um, especially as it tends to settle when you try to knock out some of the brush strokes. And so what I did is I went in for a second coat on this side, thicken it up a little bit, and sure enough, I began to lose some of the detail. And let's see, I'm going to move the lights a little bit here so I can get you a close-up of that. There we go. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Let's do a little more light. Not only is it hot, but now it's bright. All right, it's been warm and mess. So hopefully that's focusing. Okay, there we go. So um, here's the double coat. And you can see that I'm starting to lose some of the detail. See that little bubble there? Um, starting to lose a little bit of the detail. But with a single light coat, and I think I forgot to put in a cross stroke there. Like I said, I was doing this quick. Um, I maintain the block look fairly clearly. And, um, and it's got pretty good durability, actually. Even with a thin coat, I feel pretty solid about that. So I think I might go that way, mainly because those irregular indentations from the polystyrene um, kind of give it a nice already textured surface rather than having me to go in and distress individual blocks. Some of them are a little irregular because when you're cutting through, some beads are stiffer, so it bumps the engraver out of the way. Um, but I think on a large, large surface like that, those little irregularities and imperfections are going to be hidden by the, the vastness of the project and will also add a little life to it. So the plan right now then is to try to build, um, the next thing would be to try to build the um, towers that are going to go on the outside of the wall. I want to do um, a nice set of, actually wait a minute, that's the second step. I want to see how that works out. But before I do that, if I do that with the towers, then I need the matching surface for this to go, you know, to be the same material. So my thought right now is to plane, and I think I can do this fairly confidently, <laughs> Um, we'll see, is to plain sheets of the expanded bead styrene so that I can lay them on in sections. So this means I'll bisect the wall prior to doing that application, measure that out, and then I can adhere those to it. I'm hoping that the expanded um, uh, polystyrene is, it because it's a little softer, it should bend a little bit easier, but it's also prone to breaking a little bit more. So the next thing I'd like to do is do another test piece similar to the green piece I showed you in, earlier in the video and make sure I can conform that to it. If I cannot do that uh, because it is too fragile, then I'm going to have to go with the um, ex extruded poly, the high density foam for the towers because they're going to need to have the same external surface texture as the walls, uh, I think, to look right. So. If you followed all of that and are still interested in seeing the next video, you're a trooper because that is a lot to go over. But you can see it's a complicated project. It has so many different facets to it. Um, I am going to predict right now that the next series of videos, two or three at least, are going to be just as much full of uh, decision making and uh, confounding problems and experiments. So um, hopefully you find it inspiring and useful for your own work. Uh, and if you have any suggestions on some of the things I've mentioned that I'm a little concerned about, please, you know, feel free to um, contact me. You can use my, you know, uh, private message me through YouTube. You can email me, mike at terranscapes.com, or you can put comments down below. I read every one and I try to respond to most of them. 
Um, so uh, I appreciate the kind of feedback that I've gotten to this point, and I probably wouldn't have this project looking like this without that feedback. Uh, so you know, I'm, I'm in debt to the, the people who are, who are helping out. So I wanted to say thank you once again, and thank you for joining me for another video and keep your eye on the channel as of course I'll be back with more updates on this project and other projects that are in the shop right now.